Mom was in the middle of a story about her colleague Nancy when the phone rang. Dad immediately got up, a bit too excited to get away from Mom's gossiping, and responded to her disapproving gaze by saying, What? We've all finished eating. This might be important. Rooster barked outside, either to get our attention or to scare off some trespassing rodent. My little brother, seeing my dad's departure from the table as an excuse, asked if he could go outside and play with him. Mom waved him away, and while she shot off like a rocket, she poured herself some wine. I'm guessing you have somewhere more important to be as well, Jill? She asked me. Please, don't let me stop you. I'm just going to clean up and- No! I said. I'll help you with the dishes, and then you can tell me about- Dad came back, carrying the phone with him as far as he could before the cord would snap. And that was Joshua, he said, and looked out at the window. He told me there was a shadow in the sky, right above his farm. It said slowly, Hey, where's Timothy? Out playing with a rooster, I said. What shadow? Mom asked. In the sky? Yeah, Dad said and dialed a number on the phone. It was hard to see against the sky, but it obscured the stars above it. I don't know exactly what he meant, and it moved towards Robert's house. Jill, uh, can you bring Timothy inside? I think he would like to hear this. <laughs> you think it's one of those flying saucers? I said and laughed. Don't be silly, Dan. He snapped his finger and pointed outside. Timothy, in a jiffy. Oh, hey, Robert. No, that that was for my daughter. And sorry if I'm interrupting you and Melinda during dinner, but... What a bunch of floy, floy. I whispered underneath my breath and walked outside. I stopped on the porch. The stars shone above and down upon me. I never put too much thought into them into what could be hiding among them. I guess this was the last time I ever saw them with such naive indifference. Rooster wasn't barking anymore. All I could hear was the chirping of the crickets and the ringing of the wind chime blowing in the breeze. Hey, Timothy! I yelled. I can't find Rooster! He yelled back. He was somewhere near the silo, although I couldn't see him. Seriously? You lost him again, he said something I couldn't hear. Wait, I said. I'm coming down there. I grabbed the flashlight from the cabinet in the hallway, thinking to myself that the dog had run after a rabbit again, and I called out to my dad. Timothy lost rooster again. I'm going to help him find him. No, dad said, popping his head out from behind the kitchen, still with the phone to his ear, and he continued. Rooster will be fine. Just get the boy back inside. There was both excitement and worry in his voice. Okay, I said, shaking my head at his overactive imagination. Be quick, he yelled, just as I was about to close the front door. I'm talking to Officer Sanders. There's definitely something out there tonight. He lowered his voice as I jumped off the porch. No, no, it, it, it's just my daughter getting... Yeah. Right, okay. I put the flashlight on and walked down towards the silo. Timothy, I yelled. Did you find him? No response. Hey, Timothy, I walked around the silo. I swear to God, if you run into the cornfield again, I will... My words stuck in my throat. In front of me, right in the hot spot of the flashlight, was one of Timothy's shoes. It was covered in some kind of black goo that formed a track leading into the cornfield. A cold shiver crawled down my back. Dad! I yelled at the top of my lungs. Come here now! I decided to run back towards the house changed my mind and I ran toward the cornfield instead but I stopped in my tracks when I realized I had, but I stopped in my tracks when I realized I had no idea 
how to find them in the middle of the field. I didn't even dare to think about what that black goo could have been. Dad! I yelled as I climbed up the ladder at the side of the silo to get a bird's eye view of the field. Timothy is in that field! Something slowly moved across the field. I couldn't see what it was, only that the corn gave it away as it pressed forward. Dad finally ran towards the house, his flashlight in one hand and his rifle in the other. He stopped beneath the silo and picked up Timothy's shoe. Dad, I said, I'm up here. Go back inside, sweetheart, he said. Something ain't right here and... I can see where he is, I interrupted. If you run in a straight line from where you stand, you'll catch up to him. Go, Dad. And Dad took off without so much as a word. I hurried down the ladder and was just about to go back to the house and check in on Mom when Dad's rifle went off. I froze. There was another shot fired, followed by a blood-curdling scream that clearly belonged to my dad. Mom came outside, still holding the dish brush. What in God's name is going on, Jill? Go back inside and call Sanders, I said. Dad's in trouble and so is Timothy. She whispered a prayer and ran back inside, stopped at the threshold and yelled back at me. And where are you going? Come back. There's no time, Mom. And there wasn't. For every second, Timothy was dragged further away, and I climbed up the harvest combine. I wasn't really old enough to drive it, but Dad had shown me how. It wasn't fast, but it was as strong as a tank, and, and I thought it would give me some protection from whatever was out there. Mom stood at the door, furiously waving her dish brush at me. Call the police, I yelled at her as I drove towards the field. I'm going after Timothy. The combine moaned down the corn like it was nothing, and it wasn't ready for harvest yet, and it would cost us some good money. But in the given circumstances, I didn't see what other choice I had. All I could hear was the engine from the combine and the corn leaves stroking the sides of the vehicle. I kept my eyes to focus on the header. Terrified, I would accidentally run over my dad. The temperature dropped steadily the further I got into the field. I got to the point where I could see my own breath in front of my mouth. That's when I finally caught up with my little brother. He was dragged through the field by some amorphous black goo that moved forward like a slug just much quicker i couldn't believe my eyes dad was right this is something that didn't belong on earth timothy he either couldn't hear me or he was unconscious but i still tried again timothy timothy the combine stopped inexplicably right at the corner of the field and my flashlight flickered out i looked up the stars were gone covered by a menacing shadow hovering over me. It was here. I was just about to jump out, but sat down again when I saw the first black tendril. Hundreds of them followed. Hundreds of slimy tendrils slowly descending from the shadow until they surrounded me completely. They grabbed the entire vehicle like snakes working in unison and began lifting it up. Something cold wrapped itself around my neck and then everything turned black. That's the only thing I remember for waking up inside. What I had to assume was the shadow in the sky. The first thing I noticed was the smell of something reminiscent of embalming fluid. I was still inside the cabin of the combine. They, whoever they were, had taken the whole thing. I was encapsulated in darkness. But it wasn't total. A faint light came crawling down what looked like large tubes connected to the walls. The loud echo of droplets hitting a pool of water was the only sound I could hear besides my own breath. And it was freezing. My heart rate was off the charts. And my hands trembling. Not just from the cold, but from my overwhelming fear as well. I climbed out of the vehicle and stepped right into knee-high deep water. I wanted to yell for my brother to see if he was here somewhere as well, but I couldn't without having to fear of bringing unwanted attention to me. 
For now, I seem to have been left alone. And I wanted to keep it like that for as long as possible. I waded through the water until I came to one of the tubes. They were made of some kind of metal, almost like silver, but dimmer, pulsating black strings, similar to the creature that had taken my brother, covered the walls. I walked through the tube, still a bit groggy, just before it curved to the right. I heard a gloppy sound behind me. I froze and slowly turned around. Two of those unnaturally echoed through the tube. Two of those quick slugs, one attached at the bottom and one attached to the tube, moved toward me. My scream echoed through the tube. I ran the fastest I had ever run, every footstep reverberating through the metal. And then I slipped and slid downward. I reached a pretty high speed, getting further away from the creatures behind me. But when I came to a stop, I was met with three more of those hideous beasts. And there was nowhere to run. One of the slugs raised his upper body, revealing a round, toothless mouth. The black lips expanded slightly. Then it sucked in mucus from invisible holes on its body and expunged it through the mouth. The black snot hit my face with such force that I fell to the ground. The last thing I remember before losing consciousness was the smell of something akin to ammonia. I woke up in a spherical room, suspended in the middle by black tendrils. Strange instruments entangled with black goo extended from the walls with metallic arms. Here and there, attached to the slime, I could see black eyes staring at me without blinking as the instruments circled my body. I sobbed, but it didn't change their indifferent stare. One of the instruments was equipped with a long, sharp needle. It moved toward my face, and I, I shut my eyes, only to have them forced open by some other instrument appearing behind me. I begged them to stop, but the needle just kept approaching my eye. It came closer and closer. For the first time in my life, I prayed without being told to do so, and then... Not more than a second before the needle would have pierced my cornea, the entire room shook violently. The needle stopped and strange, high-frequency clicks erupted from everywhere. As a response, the creatures shrieked and hurried out of the room. I remained in this... I remained suspended in the air for some time, yelling for my brother. Everything shook and I was released by the tendrils holding me in place and I fell hard, hitting my knee on the metal floor. The pain shot through my body, but I was forced up on my feet nonetheless. The opening to the room wasn't there. You would expect to be a door. It was just a hole at the center of the wall. If it wasn't for the solid black tendrils around the opening, I would never have been able to climb out. Getting out of it was a struggle, though, as touching the substance made my hands sting as if I were climbing a wall of needles. Back inside the tube on the other side, I limped forward while keeping my blistering hands open to avoid friction. The pain was the only thing present in my mind, but I had no other choice but to ignore it and move on. I looked inside every opening. This part of the tube was connected to several rooms just like the one I had been trapped in. In one of them, after almost giving up, I found my brother. He had already suffered the fate. I had just escaped. The needle pierced his eye and entered his skull, his mouth covered in vomit and blood, trembled slightly. He, he was still alive. I, I couldn't tell what they were trying to accomplish, if they were sucking something out of him or pouring something inside of him. I, I yelled, trying to wake him up. I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I had let him sleep. He opened his left eye. I could see the sadness in it. Even though the rest of his face appeared to be paralyzed, a tear escaped from it, and he struggled to speak, and his slurred words echoed through the chamber. Help me. Please. 
He closed his eye, releasing more tears. Mom. Mom, please. Black vomit then gushed out through his mouth, silencing him. And I was just about to climb inside, even though I didn't know what I could possibly do to help him, when one of those cursed creatures appeared behind me. I'll come back for you, I said to my little brother. I said to my little brother, I promise. I had to run again. An almost impossible task, given my damaged knee, the creature was almost upon me when a part of the wall suddenly was blown out, revealing the night sky. We were soaring above the clouds, a sight I had never seen before. I had to hold on for dear life, not to be sucked outside. The creature wasn't able to do the same and disappeared into the night with a devilish hiss coming out through the hole in its mouth. I crawled forward until I reached another chamber where I could get up and on my legs again. A similar sound came from the opening nearby. Barking. Rooster? I, I, I found him all by myself. He must have gotten free in the chaos somehow. I crunched down and received him. He licked my face and wagged his tail. Good boy, I said. Now we just have to save Timothy. I didn't know how to find my way back, given that the tube I came from had all been blown out. I looked around in desperation, trying to figure something out. Rooster didn't hesitate, though. He ran up another tube, and I followed. I'm guessing he must have picked up my brother's scent. That's it. Keep going. You're doing great, I told him, hopefully. As he was, he led me right up to where I wanted to be. But my excitement quickly turned into a bottomless dread. The entire chamber had been blown out. It was replaced by a gaping hole. My brother was gone. It's possible that I could never have saved him anyway. That he could never have gotten the needle out of his brain. But I still blamed myself. I fell to my knees, holding onto Rooster's collar, and behind my tears through the giant hole in the wall, I could see a saber, jet, soaring through the air. Good boy, I whispered in Rooster's ear. Good boy, good boy, good boy. I didn't want him to think it was his fault somehow. The vessel came down. It wasn't a soft landing, but it wasn't hard either. I only saw dust outside the hole, only pierced by the early rays of the rising sun. Then I heard trucks, and just moments later I saw a group of military jeeps approaching. Shots were fired here and there, then came an explosion, and after that, a young soldier stepped out through the dust. We have a civilian over here, he yelled, and a dog. Wh where are we? I asked as he helped me up on my legs, a bit disoriented, and I continued. Wh where are my parents? You're in New Mexico, as he said, and patted Rooster on the head. Not far from Roswell. Don't worry, we'll get you home to your parents. I had to sign a lot of papers, swearing to never utter a word about what happened to anyone. Not even mom. Instead, I was instructed to tell her that I had been kidnapped by a known serial killer in our area. And dad had been killed in the field while trying to save us. Mom never believed in that fairy tale. But it wasn't until her deathbed in 1979 that I told her she had been right all along. And now I'm on my own deathbed. And I don't give a damn about my sworn silence. What really inspired me to finally tell the story was all the new sightings. Some even confirmed by the Pentagon. And I just know something is coming. And I want you to know what we'll be up against. I have an old photo next to me. A photo of my brother. I still blame myself for not keeping my promise. For not being able to save him. I lived with that guilt for a long time. and I'm not a very religious person. But I hope I'll see him soon. In one way or the other. And then I'll be able to tell him just how sorry I am. 
and rooster. He lived a long and happy life. I'm grateful for that. It's what Timothy would have wanted. (laughs) He loved that good boy. We all did.